Awesome. Well, thanks for giving me a chance to uh, talk with you all this morning. I probably know about half of you, but the other half are new to me. Uh, I was a fellow a few years ago with the group, and I'm actually coming back in a few months to join the faculty. I currently have a practice in Boise, uh, but we'll be joining the foot and ankle team in uh, mid-May. So uh, the group asked me to kind of participate in your uh, annual foot and ankle curriculum, and, and I'll be covering flat foot deformities, which um, is a highly testable topic and certainly someone something that will show up on your OIT and your boards. So we'll try to cover some of the high level concepts. We'll try to avoid getting too deep into the weeds. Um, and just like I did a few years ago when, when I gave uh, similar lectures as a fellow, we'll try to cover some OIT questions. Um, please jump in and try to make this as interactive as possible so uh, we can uh, make it engaging or as engaging as I can make it. Um, so the, the spectrum of, of foot and ankle flat foot conditions can range in age. So uh, our main goals are to cover kind of a younger patient who may come into a clinic with a flat foot deformity and kind of think about some of the principles that are related to a younger person, which may be different than a patient as we get older. Uh, we'll use some cases as the underlying crux for our discussion. And then again, we'll cover some OIT topics. So our first case is a patient who came in with bilateral foot pain. Uh, he's 21, uh, he's had long-standing pain for a number of years, uh, developmental delay, seizure disorder. He uh, lives with his parents. So um, these are just some selected clinical photos. They're not the, the patient themselves, but in general, when you um, are examining any patients, and, and I know that uh, the foot and ankle service isn't unique to this, but obviously a great history and a great physical exam are kind of the mainstays of how you lead to your diagnosis and then your x-rays and your advanced imaging if needed are gonna um, supplement that. But when you look at the flat foot, you wanna look at them from the front as well as from the back. So get them standing up uh, first. And you can see that image in the top uh, left that you can see what we call this valgus deformity through, the, uh, through that posterior image. And then um, you wanna see if they can go uh, up on the tips of their toes. And what you're looking for is a correction of that valgus into a more neutral to varus position. And that tells you, especially in a younger patient, that this is a flexible deformity um, because that can rule out things like a coalition, which we won't cover in the scope of this topic, but certainly something that you'll see in your uh, pediatric lectures and your pediatric clinics as patients transition from kind of an adolescent to adult age. Now, the image on the right is, uh, simulating what we call a silver skull test, which is trying to assess for underlying uh, heel core contractures, whether that's gastroc based or Achilles based. And so the key principles are trying to get first uh, the hand on the uh, examiner's hand on the right is really putting the subtalar joint into a more neutral position. And then you're examining uh, the angle between the lateral board of the foot, as well as the axis of the tibia and seeing how that um, dorsiflexion motion changes as you go from a, a knee flex, or sorry, knee extended to a knee flex position. And <clears throat> other things you wanna be kind of looking for are just kind of in general, this, this loss of a medial arch. And if it's a younger patient, they tend to just have flat feet kind of at baseline. But if it's an older patient, uh, have they lost this arch over time? And that's a question that's uh, certainly important to ask. And then when you're looking at them from the back, you can get what we call this too many toes sign. So the forefoot begins to abduct. And when you see this, uh, image on the, the bottom, uh, both left and right, you can see that you uh, see more of the forefoot toes than you would otherwise in a more neutral, neutrally positioned uh, uh, foot. And so in our case here, again, younger patients, um, you know, we're looking at the axis of the, of the uh, calcaneus as it's relative to the tibia here. And so this yellow line is just kind of give you a sense that, that the calcaneus kind of sits more laterally and it's not really quote unquote underneath the, uh, the tibia. And we look at some of our other kind of standard uh, imaging that we get for a new patient visit, and you're looking to see if there's any change in alignment. So on this lateral x-ray, um, we call this a disruption of Miri's line, but uh, aligned to the axis of the first metatarsal and aligned to the axis of the talus, they should be parallel. And so when they're disrupted or they have this kind of negative Miri's, if you will, um, the apex of that is really where they're flat foot is having its disruption. And so that can be through the talonavicular joint, which 
uh, as kind of a common source, but it also can be through the navicular cuneiform joint or perhaps in the first TMC joint. So it's really important to kind of follow each patient uniquely and individually as you look at these lines. And the image on the right uh, is also showing you that it aligns through the axis of the talus and an AP of the foot should be parallel to, in general, the relative position of the first metatarsal, which is an indicator of the overall forefoot. But as you get this more abducted position of the forefoot relative to the talus, and it begins to slide out more laterally, and you get these lines that are no longer parallel. So, you know, in general, obviously we always try to exhaust all forms of conservative treatment. So in a younger patient, this patient's in her 20s, they have a flexible flat foot deformity. You know, there's a variety of, of you know, historical studies that have looked at does, does treating a flat foot deformity with orthotics or shoe inserts, does that change the natural history? And it's no, but certainly uh, can make this uh, foot less symptomatic. So it's a reasonable thing to consider in a younger patient. Uh, but when you're counseling uh, patients and their families, uh, it's important to, to tell them that wearing a shoe insert for 24 seven for a year is not gonna change the underlying structural features of the flat foot, but certainly can make it less symptomatic. And for a skeletally immature patient as they transition to adulthood, that flat foot may no longer become symptomatic as they uh, reach a more um, skeletally mature overall anatomic alignment. So the questions you're gonna get on a test or the things you'll be thinking about in clinic as well is what are our surgical treatment options? And, and there's a variety of things to consider, but um, really what you're, what you're thinking about is that you have to kind of correct each feature of the underlying deformity. So uh, if you remember kind of from our first initial imaging or clinical imaging, there's this valgus component. And so um, something that we debate within the foot and ankle world is whether or not that's sufficient with just a, uh, one or dual calcaneal osteotomies. And so those can be medializing calcaneal osteotomies, which um, is certainly a common procedure that you'll see as well as the lateral column lengthening, which is another procedure where we make a cut through the calcaneal, calcaneal neck uh, more distally. And we try to uh, invert the subtalar joint as well as correct to some degree, some of the, the underlying valgus. And, and so you really wanna look at the clinical examination, the radiographic features and really understand whether or not one versus both versus one independently is really the sufficient osteotomy. But from a test taking perspective, they're not gonna really want you to make that, that subtle distinction. But one of the things that does come up commonly is after you correct the hind foot, whether it's with an osteotomy or a lateral column, you have to reassess the underlying position of the forefoot and you'll end up with this position of a forefoot varus after your correction. And that means that the first ray is elevated relative to the, to the lateral border of the foot. And so to bring that quote unquote down, um, a common uh, procedure uh, that can be an adjunct to all of this is a, what we call a cotton osteotomy. So it's making a cut through the medial cuneiform uh, and bringing the, the first uh, ray down or if they have underlying uh, degenerative arthritis of their first TMT joint, that's another option, but you're trying to balance out the foot. And so as you go through a flexible flat foot treatment, you wanna sequentially go through these questions about where well, we fixed one component, let's reassess again the component of the forefoot and then reassess that. And then also while you're doing all this, thinking about the underlying uh, heel core contracture that likely exists in an underlying flat foot. So these are some selected uh, clinical photos. These are actually from, uh, uh, from the foot and ankle team here that I borrowed uh, back as a fellow. So these are just uh, your incision, your home and retractors protecting your soft tissue structures. Uh, you can make your cut through the the uh, calcaneus, uh, the clinical image on the bottom right is showing this uh, medializing shift of the, um, of the bone. Uh, with a medializing calcaneus osteotomy, you can overcorrect them. And so certainly uh, you can put them more into varus, which is something obviously we try not to do in orthopedics, thou shalt not varus. So um, we were very careful to think about what is our overall uh, translation of our osteotomy. The, here's some just some selected imaging of, of a lateral column lengthening, which is making a cut about a centimeter and a half uh, proximal to the CC joint. And why debate about whether or not you should use autograft versus allograft? Certainly, autograft comes with um, the morbidity of its harvest. The allograft is reasonable, and I think most people tend to choose allograft. And then there are some other um, custom made implants that can be inserted, but I think most people tend to lean towards an allograft, uh, particularly in the, the group in Utah. 
And so here's some examples of what that four foot varus looks like. So if, if you look at the image right in the center there, uh, this is a study actually from, from my residency mentor um, who's now since retired, but the first ray is sitting up relative to the fifth ray. And so the key principle is that you want this uh, balanced triangle. So if you are examining the foot in the clinic as well as in the operating room, you wanna make sure that the heel and the first ray and the lateral border of the forefoot are all balanced. And so in this case, the first ray is elevated. And so some type of medial column procedure to bring that balance down. And this paper is talking about the cotton osteotomy or plantar flexion, medial cuneiform osteotomy is, is what they're describing. And so for this particular patient, they underwent a lateral column lengthening, which uh, is uh, uh, secured with an independent screw. And then um, the, the cotton osteotomy, uh, again, secured with an independent screw. And so some OIT questions that may kind of be paralleling this question of a younger uh, flat foot patient is, is a 12 year old boy who's got multiple years of pain. Uh, they're telling you that he's essentially exhausted all forms of conservative treatment when they talk about a UCBL, which is a form of an orthotic. Uh, and the question is, you know, surgical plan to address the deformity. So um, number one, answer number one, the lateral calcaneal slide osteotomy. So that's gonna be for a cable varus foot. Number two, transfer the perineus longus, the perineus brevis. That's another option for cable varus foot, so for not for flat foot. A first metatarsal dorsal flexion osteotomy. So that's bringing the first ray up as opposed to it already being up and bringing it down. So again, that's another thing that you'll be considering when you do uh, cable varus foot assessments and surgical corrections. So calcaneal neck lengthening osteotomy, or that's another way of describing a, or uh, characterizing a lateral column lengthening. So that sounds pretty attractive. And then posterior tibial tendon transfer to dorsum of the foot. That would be for a uh, foot drop or, again, for chemovirus foot deformity that may be um, more significant. So our answer is, is number uh, four. So to kind of summarize this first example of a younger patient with a flexible flat foot, really important to consistently be thinking about the various components that are underlying it. So the heel core contracture, uh, does the foot correct on examination, meaning does that valgus go to more neutral to varus position? and uh, kind of go step-by-step step in your surgical correction. There is a parallel kind of younger patient, but slightly different problem. She's 27, she's failed all forms of conservative treatment, which she viewed as therapy. Uh, she'd done casting by another provider, uh, orthotic shoe wear, um, she's otherwise healthy. She works at a local prison. So a slightly different radiographic feature. So again, you can see that these yellow lines on the AP foot are showing that the, they're parallel. So there's less of this forefoot abduction component. And really for her, it's more underlying pain. And, and the arrows are trying to indicate this, this large piece of bone, which is an accessory navicular, which uh, uh, accessory bones throughout the foot, as well as in other portions of orthopedics are very common. So not all people with accessory navicular bones uh, become symptomatic or problematic, but they can commonly be associated with underlying valgus, which is what this patient has. So she has a flat foot deformity at baseline, which she's had for a number of years, uh, her entire life. It hasn't bothered her, but for some reason, the accessory navicular became symptomatic. And she came into my clinic with uh, bony edema within the accessory navicular that was unfortunately not uh, responsive to uh, non-surgical treatment. So you can see here, uh, these are uh, axial and sagittal cuts indicating that there's this swelling on T2 signal surrounding the uh, accessory bone indicating that it is uh, active uh, despite its uh, longstanding uh, history for her. So uh, there's certainly some component of debate about how to manage an accessory navicular. Uh, simple excision alone is very reasonable, uh, but I think the consideration is whether or not this patient has underlying flat foot because those that have flat foot and a painful accessory navicular, you may be more inclined to correct the flat foot at the same time of just excising the bone alone. And when you excise the accessory navicular, you really want to try to preserve some of its plantar attachments of the posterior tibial tendon, which runs through the accessory navicular so that um, you preserve some continuity of the attachment. And so you kind of start more dorsally as you peel back the accessory navicular and gain its access and shell it out that way. Uh, in this particular patient, I decided to do some flat foot correction. So there's a osteotomy to medialize the calcaneus, which um, Seemed like I had an okay correction uh, looking at the hind foot view, which we don't have in my clinic, uh, the capabilities to do a more Saltzman traditional view. And then we did a cotton osteotomy uh, to correct the um, forefoot varus, which she had clinically in the operating room. And she's so far done relatively well. She's back to work and, and uh, relatively happy with that. So accessory navicular pain, um, 
you know, you hear terms, you may see this on your tests of a quote unquote modified kidner, um, which is uh, excising the bone. And then historically there was the discussion of advancing the posterior tibial tendon um, or just simply, if you preserve the posterior soft tissue attachments, trying to you know, reattach the uh, disrupted uh, fibers back to the navicular. Um, and uh, whether or not that patient has underlying flat foot is certainly something you want to be thinking about in the back of your mind, whether or not you need to correct that or just simply excise um, the accessory bone itself. So again, an OIT question, 18-year-old, uh, uh, painful prominence medially. Again, you've already known that this is going to be a question about accessory navicular. They're telling you that two years, there's, they're giving you examples of what non honor treatment would be reasonable. So what is the best to treatment option? So number one, total contact casting. Um, if you see total contact casting, you'll be thinking about more of diabetic ulcerations, uh, diabetic underlying shark coat deformity, steroid injection. Uh, we tend not to inject, uh, well, I would say that that injecting this uh, may be uh, something you want to try if something's, somebody's really desperate to avoid surgery, but an 18-year-old patient would tend to lean away from, from steroid injections, an MRI of the foot and chest CT scan. Uh, they're leading you more towards whether or not this is an underlying tumor or malignancy, and there's nothing that you can see on the radiographic features that look abnormal. This is relatively uh, classic for uh, um, accessory navicular bone. Open biopsy again. Um, uh, probably not the right answer. And then surgical excision is, jumps out pretty quickly as the right answer. So I've kind of covered some younger patients with flexible deformity. Anyone have any questions or uh, anything they want to uh, jump in and add to the discussion? All right, we'll keep trucking along. So uh, case two, now we've moved into uh, the more quote unquote traditional age range for an acquired flat foot deformity. Um, so a 54 year old female, long standing uh, pain, more medial sided, posterior medial around her ankle. Uh, she thinks that her foot has flattened out with time. Uh, so she had what she perceived as a more normal arch that has now gone flatter. And there are her listed medical conditions. So she's 5'10", uh, uh, 225. Uh, she exam features that are important is that she can't perform a single limb here rise. This is partly due to pain, partly due to weakness. And I think that's an important question to ask them whether or not they can't do it because it hurts or because they feel weak, because usually it's both, but I think it's a helpful question to ask as you kind of better understand what's contributing to their, their problem. Um, she has pain with uh, resisted uh, inversion of the foot with the ankle in a plantar flex position, which is kind of trying to isolate the posterior tibial tendon. And then she's tender palpation along the posterior tibial tendon itself, particularly posterior medially around the ankle and not necessarily uh, at the insertion of the navicular, which is what's different about perhaps an accessory navicular pain versus an acquired flat foot deformity. And she's flexible. So you can passively put her subtalar joint in a more neutral position and passively bring the first ray uh, down into a uh, tripod position. So these are her, her imaging. Um, you know, relatively neutral position on both, uh, on the ankle as well as the AP foot. Not a lot of disruption on the lateral x-ray in terms of if you drew, drew a line parallel to the first metatarsal as well as to the talus. But she does have some valgus when you look at the uh, underlying uh, alignment. So, you know, our, our diagnosis is, is um, the posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, acquired flat foot deformity. These are Kind of blanket terms that cover a variety of underlying conditions, but this is a paper from, from a number of years ago. The senior author was Dr. Beals's mentor, who unfortunately has since passed away. But you know, buzzwords that come out of studies like this that you'll see on tests is um, you know, histologically the tendon itself has what we call quote unquote increased mucin. And so that is a, a question I've seen uh, when I was uh, a resident uh, and studying for boards as well that. Um, buzzwords that they look for for you to kind of understand is increased mucin, uh, fibroplasts, chondroid metaplasia, neovascularization. All these things are kind of indicative of an underlying unhealthy tendon. And again, that tendon degeneration, degeneration tends to happen in what we call this watershed zone, which exists behind the medial malleolus and it's course towards the navicular, but it's not necessarily at the insertion of the navicular itself. And, and this area isn't because of those 
histologic features is not necessarily an inflammatory condition, uh, though NSAIDs are part of the uh, common quote unquote non operative treatment. Um, they may be working for other reasons as opposed to the underlying tendon itself. So flat foot, uh, slightly older patient, uh, but it is flexible. Um, you know, we kind of walk through these different stages of a flat foot, which you may come across when you're doing your studying for, for your various exams. And, you know, stage one is probably not something that you're ever going to get a test question on because it's relatively uncommon for somebody who has no underlying existing deformity, but has pain along the posterior tibial tendon looks relatively healthy on an MRI. Um, that would be someone who may get a simple debridement of the posterior tubal tendon, but for test taking purposes and for your understanding, that really is gonna be an uncommon procedure. What you're gonna see most of is distinguishing between stage two and stage three. Because stage four is a black box for all of us in the orthopedic foot and ankle world. And so stage two and three is really distinguishing between people who have flexible deformities and stage three are people who have um, more rigid or not correctable deformities. And so in this case, we, we determined that based on our physical exam, she does have flexible uh, foot. So she really falls into the more stage quote unquote two range. And in that scenario, we tend to try to do joint salvage procedures. And so um, that's gonna be people who get calcaneal osteotomies, um, maybe a tendon transfer like the FDL and balancing out the foot like we've seen in some of the other um, uh, x-rays today with, with a cotton osteotomy, perhaps, or some type of medial column adjunct. Stage three is going to be more rigid patients, which uh, shockingly we'll cover with another case. Uh, and stage four is, is again, um, a little bit unknown about how to best manage. So in these highly controversial areas, they should not and would not be um, uh, testing you on those. So can you treat, you know, flexible flat foot deformity that's been going on for six months, 12 months, non-operatively? Sure, it's it's certainly a reasonable thing to try. And, and this is a study that gets cited often with uh, Dr. Saltzman's work a number of years ago, uh, particularly for these uh, more flexible patients. Um, a dedicated course of physical therapy with an orthotic um, can significantly improve their pain. And um, I've seen it as a training. I've seen it in practice where people come back and it's not, again, not going to change their underlying foot deformity. Um, or the position of their foot, but certainly can uh, make their symptoms much better and avoid an operation. Um, the question that you'll get asked in clinic is from patients is, you know, how long do I need to wear this brace? And for some people that's kind of uh, for the foreseeable future, but um, at least I tell them that we give it a shot for three to six months and see what the brace does and then trial it outside the brace. And that may give us an answer because these braces are particularly for a younger, healthier patient uh, who may be a reasonable candidate for surgery if they fail not after treatment. The brace is harder to wear in certain shoes and it certainly is not the most cosmetically appealing thing in the world. So um, I don't think that uh, uh, committing them to a lifelong brace is uh, uh, necessarily something you have to do for them. This is another example of patients who are treated with uh, Arizona bracing, so slightly different. It's this kind of uh, leather uh, stirrup or leather lace-up brace uh, with basically a UCBL within the foot component itself. Um, and again, also can can work. Uh, but what's most helpful and not after treatment like it is for most things in orthopedics that if you catch them earlier in their disease process, you'll have greater success with the therapy and a bracing. These are some other examples that may show up on clinical uh, photos that may show up on your exams. So uh, AFO is, is something I imagine most people have seen, which is just uh, an example on the left. This UCBL is a custom mold uh, foot-based insert. And then in Arizona is um, this uh, highly attractive leather-based custom uh, brace that uh, ties up in the front, but then also has a um, uh, usually some type of foot uh, component as well built into the brace itself. And so an acquired flat foot, again, we're kind of thinking about the same things that we did for our younger patient with a flexible flat foot. Um, how can we uh, salvage the joints, but also correct the underlying deformity? And so uh, for test taking purposes, you know, from in the real world, there's a variety of ways to treat this and, and people um, manage it, you know, kind of subtly in their own different ways. But for test taking purposes, just doing a tender transfer alone will not be the right answer. Uh, you'll need to do some type of corrective osteotomy to balance out the foot. So whether that's medializing calcaneal osteotomy, lateral column lengthening, but just an isolated FDL transfer is not gonna be the answer that you wanna choose. And then the other thing to think about in, 
is part of all this is that as the foot begins to flatten out, you lose some of the underlying um, structure that holds uh, the uh, tail and navicular joint together, or this underlying spring ligament. And so that spring ligament um, gets stretched out uh, with both long standing and more quote unquote flatter feet. And how we manage spring ligament issues in the operating room is, is challenging and certainly one of the more challenging things that we don't have great answers for. Um, but that's another component to all of this is this underlying spring ligament. So this patient got an FDL transfer, which is through a drill hole through the navicular and a calcadial osteotomy. So we'll look at some OIT questions. A 56 year old female, nine month trial of orthotics. So they're already kind of telling you that um, they're failing some form of conservative treatment. Their forefoot's abducted, they're in valgus. They can't perform a single limb here rise, but it's flexible, uh, which they nicely tell you. And there's an Aquinas contracture like we've, we've talked about. So what is the most appropriate way to go? Uh, number one, tenosynovectomy followed by orthotic. Uh, like we said, just abrading the tendon alone is gonna be very rare to, uh, in the clinical world and, and very rare for test taking purposes. Number two, Dwyer closing wedge calcaneal osteotomy. So Dwyer is a, is a term for a closing wedge laterally based or lateralizing the calcaneus osteotomy. So again, that, that's the opposite of a flat foot. So that's a cabovarus foot and then a first metatarsal closing wedge osteotomy. So closing wedge will dorsiflex the foot. So again, another option for a cabovarus foot and then plantar fascia release is another component of some cable varus foot corrections. Number three, immediatizing calcaneal osteotomy. Um, again, sounding good. Lateral column lengthening, sure. FDL transfer, Achilles lengthening, that seems possible. Number four, arthrodesis. Uh, so triple arthrodesis is what they're saying there. Um, if somebody's flex, if they're saying that somebody's flexible, then we try to avoid uh, joint fusions if at all possible. Um, so I would say four is off the table there. And then five, lateralizing calcaneal osteotomy. You know right away that that one's not gonna be right because in order to correct the flat foot, you need to medialize the calcaneus. So the correct answer is number three. Another question, lower limb orthotic figure A. So we know that's an AFO. How would you manage an AFO? Not for a bunion, uh, not for midfoot arthritis, not for big toe arthritis, not for diabetic foot neuropathy, so flat foot deformity. And then another example, you know right away now from this clinical photo that you've seen several times, four foot varus. So the first ray is elevated relative to the fifth ray. So uh, as you scan through the question uh, in the operating room, you know, what are you gonna do? Um, dorsiflexion osteotomy of the medial cuneiform. So do we wanna bring the first ray or the medial column higher like a dorsiflexion or do we wanna bring it down? So even though that sounds initially attractive because we do cuneiform, we don't want to dorsiflex. So that's not the right answer. Number two, tail and navicular fusion. Uh, certainly something you can do. Um, and I think that's somewhat misleading on this particular example uh, because they don't totally tell you um, what they've done to the subtalar joint, uh, but you can assume that they're not doing a fusion. But that's one of the reasons why I don't love this question. No further maneuvers, uh, no. Uh, derotation through the transverse tarsal joints. So it's a, a wordy way of saying that you need to do something through either the first DMT joint uh, or some type of, of adjunct. So that, that's a possibility. Derotation of the forefoot through the CC joint alone, uh, that is, uh, you're not able to achieve that through the CC joint. So actually the correct answer is number four. And then again, same thing with the, Four foot varus, what's the most appropriate treatment option during a reconstruction? Number one, we just said no dorsiflexion. In site two, anything in site two means that you're not correcting the underlying deformity, so that's going to be off the table. Number three, plantar flexion, opening wedge, cuneiform osteotomy. That sounds attractive. That sounds exactly like a cotton osteotomy. And four, lateral column lengthening. And so that's not going to address the underlying four foot varus. And then subtalar fusion again won't address it either. So correct answer is three. So to summarize kind of where we're at right now, the non-opera treatment is certainly something reasonable uh, to consider when you're talking to patients. And so when you meet them in clinic, you know, ask them what kind of bracing they've done, if they have the brace in clinic, can they show it to you so you can see if, how well it fits, what type of brace was made, especially uh, also with orthotics. It's a, a great question if they do have it with them so you can take a look. 
And then if they are flexible, like they are in this particular case, again, the correct answer is not going to be tendon transfer alone. You have to do some type of bony adjunct. And that's true for, for the clinical world as well. But since a large majority, if not all of you, are going to go into uh, some other specialty besides foot and ankle, uh, really thinking about what are the questions that would be asked on tests. So uh, shockingly, we're going to uh, move, move our way up the, the stages, if you will, of, of flat foot uh, deformity. So this is a 60-year-old guy who came to my clinic. He's got long-standing pain, deformity. Um, he's got type 2 diabetes, so it's well-controlled. He has underlying dense neuropathy. He used to drink uh, heavily, but has been in remission for a number of years. And he's a larger guy, 275, 5'9", can't do a single MRIs. He is densely neuropathic with monofilament testing all the way up to his mid-tibia, but he doesn't have any ulcerations. And he hurts both medially and laterally, uh, but particularly laterally. And his foot is rigid, so he has this flat deformity that I can't correct uh, on the exam table. And so the, these photos are, are some more dramatic examples of how this foot can slowly uh, slide out uh, and get this, what we call dorsolateral peritaylor subluxation. Now this patient, another component of all this is probably some type of neuro neuropathic arthropathy um, because of his underlying neuropathy, but this is largely a, a flat foot deformity that has led to being a rigid deformity. And you can see on the image, the first one on the left that the tail of the navicular joint is uncovered. So you, you can see that both on the AP foot as well as this AP ankle. So those yellow x-rays are showing that the talus is uncovered. You can see a large portion of the tailor head, which means that the navicular has um, uh, done this, what we call dorsal lateral translation. And then the other arrow is indicating that they get a lot of lateral pain as that foot slides further out from underneath them. They can get impingement uh, between the fibula and the talus and the fibula and the calcaneus. Um, and again, on our alignment views, you can see that they're uh, valgus as well. So, you know, what are our options? Um, uh, we tried bracing for him and it just uh, was not working out well and he was having continued pain. So, you know, in a rigid flat foot, you know, we think about um, fusion. And so that's going to be when you, you know, see the words flat foot and rigid and your test questions, uh, think fusion. Uh, and the subtle distinction in our world is whether or not to do a double versus a triple orthodesis. And really that's uh, incorporating the CC joints. So double orthodesis is talonavicular, subtalar joint, triple is subtalar, talonavicular, and, and calcaneal cuboid joint. Um, and you want to keep the foot in, in some degree of physiologic valgus, and you want to, again, keep the forefoot, midfoot region in neutral. So that's, again, talking about these uh, balancing step-by-step -step approach. It's true for flexible as it is for rigid corrections. But you know, fusing joints it does have legitimate complications, and so the non-union rates in you know uh, arthrodesis is 10 to 25 percent, and lead to malunion, uh, which uh, is certainly a very problematic component because if they peel them, they're malunited. You certainly have to consider either taking it down or doing uh, surrounding osteotomies to balance the foot back out. Um, recurrence. Uh, uh, occurs through, if they, assuming they've fused, the recurrence is really more a reflection of, of surrounding joints that have led to degenerative deformity and change. And so this is a patient that uh, we saw at three months. He's doing well. He's happy. We did a triple on. I selected a triple because he has, uh, he's a larger guy. He has underlying neuropathy, which um, you know is pros and cons of, of trying to fuse joints and, and underlying neuropathy. They certainly have slightly higher risk of non-union because of that. We used uh, proximal tibia bone graft harvest. We lengthened his gastroc. And at the same time, we, we um, repaired his deltoid. And so he's looking good at three months. He's, he's happy, he's starting to weight bearer. And then he comes back at nine months, still very happy, he's pain-free, but you can see what's going on here at the ankle. And, and if you look at that yellow line, that's a quote unquote, that's not great, but if it's parallel to the tibia, you can see that the ankle is drifting into to valgus. And this is one of these things that we see often in flat foot deformities is that you um, you correct one component. And then uh, as Dr. Beals and Dr. Saltzman and Dr. Nickers will teach you that, that follow-up uh, can be both your friend and your enemy. And um, in this scenario, he's happy, he's doing well, but that's probably because he has underlying neuropathy. Um, and so this, this valgus of the ankle is starting to develop. And this is something that's really common. So in this particular study, this is 27% of patients had started to develop this valgus tilt after fusion. And what 
what you're doing is you're just changing the underlying biomechanics of the foot. You've, you've fused joints, and so now all the stress is concentrated through another region. And in, in flat foot deformities, it's not, someone doesn't um, binarily go from a stage three to a stage four, for example, it's a continuum. And so, you know, there's a stage three, you know, plus or minus and a stage four minus where people can have not a lot of obvious valgus features of their ankle before you correct their hind foot. So you treat them like a stage three, but what begins to uh, appear afterwards is that they probably had underlying deltoid. And I knew at the time of this that his deltoid was not a great quality. And so, you know, in hindsight, should I have considered doing a allograft deltoid reconstruction at the same time of our surgeries? Did I put him in a position of his foot that led to more concentrated stress of his deltoid? These are all the things you have to think about as to somebody who develops not necessarily a complication, but a known component of, of underlying flat foot. But, you know, thankfully at this point, he's, he's happy, but we'll have to watch him closely. Uh, OIT question, 46 year old female, overweight. Um, and we can see here, just like on the last image, you know, there's tail and avicular on coverage. And so they're trying to clue you in about, you know, flat foot deformities oftentimes have heel core contractures. And, and uh, number two is hallux varus. Um, what they may be trying to trick you into thinking is that flat foot deformities can oftentimes have bunions, so hallux valgus, but they're not necessarily always related to each other, or always seen at the same time, but that may be what they're trying to trick you into thinking. So that's hallux valgus, not Harris, hallux varus. Forefoot adduction. Uh, forefoot abduction is what you'd see with flat foot, hind foot varus. No, you'd see hind foot valgus, clawing of the toes. Again, they're probably trying to get you more along the lines of a cable virus foot, which can have clawing of the toes. So the answer is number one. So uh, conclusions for this rigid flat foot, you think fusion, if not op treatment fails, um, but it's a, it's a legitimate surgery with uh, sizable risks that you need to counsel your patients on and then they come with the prolonged non-white bearing recovery, which is challenging, you know, particularly as patients get older and they may be um, you know, heavier, uh, that being truly not weight bearing is difficult. And if they can't do that, it certainly elevates the risk for um, either wound issues or non union. So kind of on the same, same line, this is just an example of what stage four might look like. So somebody comes to your clinic, they have underlying foot deformity, but they have clear valgus uh, at the ankle. And how we manage this is, again, like I said, from the beginning, a stage four is not gonna show up on your test because it's just, it's very difficult for us to know what to do. One option is to fuse the underlying uh, foot below the ankle and do either a simultaneous total ankle or uh, stage it. Um, uh, this is another option that uh, is popularized by uh, some of the foot uh, orthopedic foot and ankle surgeons is just to do a triple and then do a deltoid reconstruction at the same time. Um, yeah, doing the deltoid reconstruction, you need to have some flexibility through the ankle and and can you truly know that on uh, just a fluoro image in the clinic of moving the ankle around or will you know that at the time of surgery? And so there's even further discussion about stage 4A and 4B, but again, for the purposes of your learning about flat foot deformities, stage 4 won't show up, but you may see it in clinic um, and it's a tough problem. And we don't have any answers. Well, I certainly don't have any answers. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Peels, Dr. Nagish, and, and Dr. Saltzman would say that this, this is a very challenging problem as well. So we'll kind of conclude here and I'll try to leave some time for questions, but mainly get you guys to, to clinic and to the ORs. Um, so main thing, just like for all orthopedic problems, non-operative treatment first for all stages of uh, flat foot deformity is very reasonable and can lead to uh, legitimate success. And so you're not gonna change the underlying deformity with bracing but you can make their foot much less symptomatic. If you do find a flexible flat foot in clinic or on your test, think about transfers and osteotomies and not just transfers alone. And if they're rigid, think about fusion. They won't make you distinguish between a double versus a triple, but that discussion is certainly something that will come up when you're on the foot and ankle service. And whether or not the ankle's involved is certainly an important feature. So always get ankle and foot x-rays at the same time. Uh, so that you can see if they've started to develop uh, ankle valgus at the same time of an underlying flat foot. So I'll kind of stop here. I'll give uh, um, some opportunity to ask questions if anyone has them. Uh, otherwise, I look forward to uh, meeting the other half of you that I have not met in person and um, uh, getting a chance to spend time either in, on the foot and ankle service or when I'm uh, on call at the, at the U. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Nixon. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.